بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي Welcome to the third third session of uh, the evolution of fiqh and so far we have talked about the introduction to the topic as well as the um, foundational stage which was the stage of revelation which is the stage when the Quran was being revealed to the Prophet and this is the stage when uh, the Sharia in its sources were completed okay so last time we ended by talking about the two kinds of classifications alaikum, the two classifications in uh, revelation first one was the Meccan revelation and the second one was the Medinan revelation so we said that the definition of the Meccan revelation is anything which was revealed before the Hijra is known as the Meccan revelation okay uh, it does not mean necessarily that the verses were revealed in Mecca they could have been revealed um, outside Mecca near Mecca in Taif or uh, in Hudaybiyah later on but these any verses which were revealed before the Hijra itself they are known as the Meccan surahs or Meccan verses the uh, Medinan surahs are anything which was revealed after the Hijra okay whether it was in Medina or at Badr or at Tabuk or even in Mecca okay but that would be Medinan revelation so even though it was revealed in Mecca some verses might have been revealed in Mecca later on but those are not called Meccan revelation they are known as the Medinan revelation and this is the general classification which the Quranic scholars they give to this um, the distinct feature of the Meccan revelation was emphasis on Iman building Iman okay because this is the first stage of the development of the Muslim community so the foundation has to be the faith if the faith is not strong then later on there will be problems later on there will be issues when the laws are revealed um, that is why there is a lot of emphasis on Iman on faith uh, on the day of judgment on hellfire and paradise on the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala his tawheed the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all of these things which build your your spirituality and once your spirituality is built then later on in the Medinan revelation Allah reveals laws uh, about marriage about economics about war and so on and so forth so the Meccan revelation is the period before Hijra as I already stated and this is concerned with the building of the ideology of Islam okay? the identity of Islam itself which is the spiritual identity the faith identity this is where the six pillars of faith come into the picture the six pillars of faith what are the six pillars of faith anyone can quickly remind me believe in Allah and his books his books his messengers his messengers the angels the angels and the qadr uh, qadr qadr of Allah that everything good and evil comes with the permission of Allah or happens with the permission of Allah and, and I think the, day, yeah. the, day of judgment. the hereafter day of judgment you know hellfire paradise all of those would be part of the uh, pillars of faith so that is what this uh, earlier uh, order of the verses was mainly concerned with and the main um, topic was Tawheed okay? and a lot of emphasis was put on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's correct understanding so remember that before Islam the Arabs did have an understanding of Allah they did believe in Allah okay? it was not that they completely denied the existence of Allah actually they believed that Allah was the supreme God Okay. The problem was that they had given certain attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to their idols or they had given some of the attributes of human beings to Allah. 
just like in Christianity, the concept of Jesus being the son of God was there. In pre-Islamic Arabia, the angels were considered to be the daughters of Allah. So this is the very same kind of a concept uh, which you find in Christianity, for example. So the emphasis was, okay, you already know about Allah, but let's correct now your understanding about Allah because it is not perfect. It is impure. You have, you know, um, you have mixed it up with your pagan beliefs okay, and worshiping others besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Meccan revelations declared Allah's unique unity and pointed out that gods besides Allah are no benefit. Meaning these gods cannot benefit you, they cannot harm you, so you need to only trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another area was the existence of Allah and this as I said was not in question by the majority of the people in Arabia. Majority of the people in Arabia believed in Allah's existence. But there were a few people who raised some doubts on this subject. And that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentioned in the Quran, verses talking about his creation, about planning, about the intelligence in the creation, which actually shows that there is a creator. So Allah tried to prove his existence through the creation itself. And this is one of the good ways one should introduce the topic of Allah to those who disbelieve in a God to start with. Okay, one should remind them of the intelligent design within the human being, within the creation of Allah, within the nature, how the space is running. And if you ponder about this reality, you will reach the conclusion that there has to be somebody who is taking care of all of these things and they cannot be happening randomly by themselves. So some of the verses dealt with Allah's existence. Another major area was afterlife and this needed a lot of work in Arabia especially because the Arabs by the time of Prophet Muhammad wasallam, had come to believe that once they die that's the end of everything meaning there is no afterlife even though they believed in Allah they believed in God they believed in their idols and they sought their help for rain for crops for you know war whatever they were in so they had this spiritual belief of you know ghayb, unseen that there is an unseen power they did believe in this but they said that this unseen power is of no more use to them once they die meaning there is no afterlife so a lot of verses if you look at the meccan revelation and if you want to refer to meccan revelation you go to the last surahs of the quran most of them are Meccan, the short surahs in the Quran, the final one, they deal with the Meccan revelation. A lot of them deal with the day of judgment. A lot of them deal with the signs of the day of judgment. A lot of them deal with the uh, horrors of the day of judgment. A lot of them talk about the hellfire, the different punishments of the hellfire, the different levels of the hellfire. A lot of them talk about Jannah, paradise, and how beautiful it is and what kind of deeds lead to it. So it is building a very strong aqidah about afterlife. Because if you do not believe in afterlife in a very strong sense, what will happen is that will reflect in your deeds. Because that would mean that you will give preference to this world over the next world. And when you start giving preference to this world over the next world, what starts happening to your deeds? Your deeds start reflecting that. Meaning your deeds start limiting you to things which will benefit you in this world. Your deeds reflect your fears from this world, your love, your desires regarding this world. Whereas the next world is just a concept which you say you believe in, but it does not have any practical implications. So it is important as Muslims that we build a very strong foundation in our aqidah of the afterlife. Because the stronger it is, the easier it will be to go through this life, to go through the difficulties of this life, to sacrifice things in this life. Um, because your desire for the afterlife is much greater than this life. So the Meccan revelation has actually a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, common ground with our times and you know, our uh, faith building, our Islam. Okay, this is how we should build our Islam. This is Allah is teaching us how to build your religion. You start with Tawheed, 
you start with faith, you start with an afterlife, you start with Allah, recognizing Allah. And this is how we should teach our children. When our children are growing up, these are the areas you should emphasize a lot on. The laws will come later. A lot of parents, they focus a lot on, you need to do this, this is halal, this is haram. You know, but they don't really build the foundation for that. And then what happens is that yes, the children, they grow up as adults knowing this is halal and this is haram, but they really don't see the point in following that halal and haram. They really don't see the justifications in it. They don't see, you know, how that affects me in my heart. Okay, so it's an outer shell that you build around your children called Islam. But inside this shell, there is hollowness. Inside this shell, there is emptiness. There is nifaq, there is hypocrisy. Why? Because we started from the wrong end. You don't start with the laws, you start with iman. And I'm not saying that you don't teach them the laws. It's very important to teach them the laws. But the focus should be, the majority of the upbringing should be based around the love of Allah, the fear of Allah, the oneness of Allah, loving paradise, hating hellfire, you know, being scared of being questioned on the day of judgment. All of these concepts should be ingrained in our children's hearts so that they could become a true Muslims and good Muslims when they grow up. So the Meccan revelation is, is a great guide for us regarding this. Another area which the Meccan revelation focuses on is stories of the past generations. Okay, Stories related to Ad and Thamud, uh, which were nations in the Arab uh, continent or Arab peninsula. Uh, and the people, the Arabs, when they would travel from Syria to Mecca or go down towards Yemen, they would see the ruins of some of these past nations. And they knew that these nations were great nations and that they were destroyed. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala linked their knowledge of these nations with religion. Okay? Because a lot of times what happens is when you see ruins, okay, in all, all areas of the earth you will find old civilizations and ruins of the past. Okay? In America you will find them, you go to, uh, you go to uh, Egypt, you will find the pyramids, you will find the you know, traces of other nations who existed before us. Back home in India, Pakistan, you also find these ruins of past nations. But what happens is we see them as historical uh, and cultural places. We do, we're not able to link them with our spirituality. We're not able to link them with our deen, with our religion. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he focuses, reminding us over and over again in the Quran, don't you see what happened with the past nations before you? Have you forgotten what happened with Fir'aun? Have you forgotten what happened with Ad and Thamud? Have you forgotten about you know, how they disbelieved in Allah and denied Allah and were arrogant in the land and how Allah punished them? Some were punished by stones which Allah showered upon them from the heavens. Some of them were punished with earthquakes. Some of them the floods took. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala links the nations of the past with the current nations and that common ground is to learn from the lessons which you know they have left behind and the lesson is if you do not believe in Allah then the punishment will come and those nations which believe in Allah and obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them more growth Allah gives them uh, dunya and obviously they will be receiving the akhirah in the, the afterlife also stories are a great way of teaching people many of us we like to hear stories from the time we were young up to this this point. I personally love stories <laughs> and I'm sure that all of you, you love stories. Why? Because stories are easy on the ears. It's not like hard, hardcore instruction happening. And at the same time, you are learning from the beautiful messages which are inside the story. That is why in the Quran, you find so many stories. If you read Surah Yusuf, we love how, how many times you read Surah Yusuf, you, you still find you know treasures and pearls in in it guidance in it every time you read it it seems like you're reading this story this new story which you you don't know much about story of adam and uh, hawa adam and eve and shaitan what happened with the creation stories of nuh alayhi salam and his struggles with his nation 
story of Ibrahim alayhi salam with the king and then later on with his, his children and so on and so forth. Story of Musa alayhi salam and Bani Israel. These are stories which have a lot of guidance in them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who created us knows that we love stories and that's how he teaches us. That is why one of the most effective ways of teaching kids and even adults is through stories. Okay. So Meccan revelations deal with a lot of stories. The only act of, the only legal injunction, if you want to say, a law which was revealed in Mecca was related to the Salah, the prayer itself. There were no other rituals, no other laws. There is no fasting in Mecca. There is no Hajj obviously in Mecca because the idol worship is still dominant in Mecca. A zakah is not mentioned in Mecca, zakah is still not institutionalized. Marriage laws, divorce laws, none of these laws exist. The only law which was revealed in Mecca was the law of Salah, which tells you that after you have built the foundation of spirituality, after you have built the foundation of Tawheed and love of Allah and Akhirah, what is the first thing you need to start with if you want to now transfer to the laws? What is the transition between the spiritual world and the legal world of Islam? Is the salah, is the prayer. That's where you start off. That's what you teach your children the first thing. That's what you teach the new Muslims when they come to Islam. Okay? That's what you focus yourself on the most. Out of all the laws which are out there which you need to follow, salah is the most important one. And that is why the Prophet, peace be upon him, he said that the contract between us and them is the Salah. Meaning the contract between Allah and his messenger and the believers is the prayer. If you leave your part of the contract, Allah will leave his part of the contract. If you start missing your prayer, neglecting your prayer, not or being lazy in your prayer, not giving it its due rights, then what will happen? Allah will also start ignoring you and leaving you alone and the protection will be taken away. Salah is a constant reminder. Okay? And this is something which once again shows Allah is the one who sent Islam. Because Islam, the laws in Islam, they sync beautifully with the human nature. Human psychology. Islam understands human psychology. If you look today to the advertising industry, how many millions and billions of dollars are spent on these advertisements? Why don't they just show you this advertisement one time and say, okay, now you know our product. It's good enough. Okay. Why do they have to show you the same advertisement five times during you know, a show or ten times during the day? And if you count in, in a month, you might have seen that advertisement 50 times, 100 times. Why is that? This is based on research. This policy of repeating the product and showing it to you over and over and over again, this is based on research. They understand that this is what human nature is like. The thing which is shown to us the most will stick to our brains. And then when we go out there to purchase and we see that same product which we have seen 50 times versus another product which we have not seen, which one do you think you will go for? You say, oh, this brand is really good. This brand is really famous. I know about it. Okay, I have seen this thing. And so that's how it becomes famous and that's how they market their products. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used the same strategy 1400 years ago with the Salah. With the Salah. It's, it's five times a day the advertisement of Allah is coming. Okay, soon as you forget, Reminder again. Soon as you forget, reminder again. So it's always on your mind. Allah is always on your mind. As opposed to going to the masjid once a week. Some Muslims, they just come to the masjid or they pray maybe once a week. Juma prayer. So okay, Juma is the only prayer. I'm going to pray the rest of them. It's okay. Their mindset is different. They only get that reminder once a week. So maybe Juma they get the reminder. By Saturday, they have forgotten about the reminder. What do you think their state of mind is by Thursday? <laughs> Completely forgotten about Allah. Allah is not in their mind at all. So halal comes, haram comes, doesn't matter to them. 
it's the same for them because their mind does not have Allah in it. Their hearts are not remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's not enough. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He reminded us five times a day that He's watching. Five times a day you communicate with Allah. Five times a day you remind yourself, one day I'm going to go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So a person who has this feeling, who lives throughout his day, throughout his week, in this state, his actions will be very different than the one who is coming once a week. Okay? So, subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala understands human nature. And he has designed the religion of Islam according to this human nature. Okay? And if we follow it, then we will be successful. So, Salah was the only, only ritual. Because of the critical relationship between Salah and Tawheed, Salah was the only other pillar of Islam to be legislated in Mecca beside, besides the Shahada. Shahada obviously had to be there because if you're becoming a Muslim, then you have to say your Shahada, you have to believe in Allah and His Messenger. But after that, Salah was the first one. Another thing which the Quran focuses on a lot in the Meccan revelation are the challenges. Okay. Uh, in a lot of different verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He challenges the Arabs to bring a book like the Qur'an. And this is one of the unique features of the Qur'an. You pick up any other religious book, it will not challenge you the way the Qur'an does. It will not lay out all its cards on the table and say, here, try to meet this up, try to match this, if you're truthful. You'll never find any religious book, you know, do that. Which is again telling us how this religion is from Allah. Because Allah is the only one who can challenge the entire humanity with a challenge. None of us as human beings can do something which no other human being can match. No matter how skillful you are in something, there will be somebody out there who can beat you in that. There will be somebody out there who can compete with you in that skill. Okay? No matter how good you are. The only one you cannot compete with is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is exactly what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did. Said, if this book is not from Allah, bring a book like it. They couldn't do it. If this book is not from Allah, bring 10 chapters like it. They couldn't do it. If this book is not from Allah, bring one chapter like it. They couldn't do it. If this book was not from Allah, find a contradiction. They couldn't do it. Today, if you go to some of these uh, websites called, you know, such as Answering Islam and, you know, all these websites which uh, people have created to bash Islam, you will find, you know, contradictions in the Quran. And some of the contradictions, if you go over them, it's amazing that the Quraysh, they never mention any of those contradictions. The ones who hated Islam, the ones who were looking for the smallest error so that they could, ca they could catch on to to those errors, they never mention those contradictions which today the Orientalists and the Christians they are pulling out saying here this is a contradiction in the Quran. When they, the Arabs, understood the language better. Most of these contradictions are related to language. Okay, If you go, go back to that, okay Allah created the heavens and the earth in six days or eight days. These are the kind of contradictions they pull out. According to one set of verses, it's six days, and according to another set of verses, it's eight days. Well, the Quraysh never pulled that out because they understood what Allah was saying. When He was saying He created the earth in two days, and then put mountains on them by four days, and then built the heavens in two days, they understood it to mean six. It was their language. But you are understanding it to mean eight, that's your problem then. See, these are the kind of contradictions people will come up with uh, and try to baffle the Muslims with. See, it says this over here and that over there. No, it doesn't say this over here and that over there because if that was the case, the Arabs would have been the first one to notice it. It was revealed in Arabic. You don't even know Arabic. You are pulling out this, these contradictions from English translations of the Quran. Doesn't make sense. So, any contradiction, any so-called contradiction in the Quran can be easily explained if you go back to the original Arabic language. Okay, most of these contradictions seem like that because you are trying to understand them in different languages which are not Arabic. Allah did not reveal, Allah did not say there will be no contradictions in the translations of the Quran. Did Allah make that challenge? 
that you translate the Quran in any language and the Quran will it will be perfect that's not the challenge challenge is the Quran itself find a contradiction in the Quran itself okay and brother Zahid mashallah he did a whole uh, lecture series on the uh, the beauty of the language and one of the areas he mentioned was the contradictions uh, of the Quran and you cannot find it. Uh, so much so that the word ikhtilafan which Allah uses in the Quran only appears once in the whole Quran Allah says if this was not from Allah then you would have find many ikhtilafan in the Quran many contradictions in it. so if you literally pick it up and say okay let's see if there are other ikhtilafan in the Quran you won't even find that there's only one ikhtilafan in the entire Quran so subhanallah Quran is perfect when it comes to its language its grammar when it comes to its miracles when it comes to the scientific information it gave us when it comes to the historical information historical facts it provided for us when it comes to the linguistic uh, word choice Allah subhanahu ta'ala's word choice why he used one set of word here and a different set of word there it makes perfect sense according to the language of the Arabs according to the language of the time of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam once again you cannot understand the Quran in the modern Arabic the modern Arabic is very different than the classical Arabic you have to go back to the classical Arabic and then find what those words meant in that culture and in that time so a lot of focus of Meccan revelation is challenges Allah challenges humanity with a lot of different things any questions on the Meccan revelation what are the first two points the first two points what were the first two points those of you those of you who are taking notes <laughs> mental notes what was the first point Tawheed. number one and number two the existence of Allah proving that Allah exists okay so those are the first two uh, issues related to that any other questions on Meccan revelation Okay. Now we move on to the Medinan revelation. As we said, the Medinan revelation is the revelation after the Hijrah. Any ayah which was revealed, any surah that was revealed after Hijrah is considered Medinan revelation. Okay, even though it did not come in Medina, it might have come in another place. Yes, sir. <laughs> One of the challenges uh, in Meccan revelation is Yes. He challenging he's challenging the, the head of Quraysh. Yes. If yes. he got to Islam then he will destroy exactly. Islam. Exactly. And he never exactly. will. So that's mashallah, we have students inside everywhere. Okay. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah uh, you know Masad, he says, Tabbat Yada Abi Lahabi wa tab. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala curses Abu Lahab and basically destines him to hellfire. Okay. This revelation came while Abu Lahab, Abu Lahab was still living. This did not come after the death of Abu Lahab. Abu Lahab is still living. Allah curses him and says, you are going to the hellfire. All Abu Lahab needed to do to disprove Islam was become a Muslim. All Abu Lahab needed to do to, to bring down this whole religion at that point. Okay, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. Now, what about Allah? Allah cursed me. Allah destined me for the hellfire, and I came to Islam. How can I, how can He curse me and destine me to the hellfire? But you see, Allah did not, since Allah is the one who is controlling the destinies, the hearts of people. Allah did not let him do that. This is all he needed, just for propaganda. Even if he was false in his heart. He just needed to say the Shahada and okay, end of Islam over there in that sense because Allah would be contradicting himself. In one place he says the believers would go to Jannah. In another place it would have been Abu Lahab coming to Islam and say, saying the Shahada and so on and so forth. So Allah did not allow him to do that. Allah did not allow him to take the Shahada in order to uh, confuse the new Muslims or the, uh, the, the Ummah at that point. It doesn't, it doesn't sound like a challenge, it sounds like a punishment. It? Yeah, but the challenge would have been that you cannot come to Islam now. That's what it means. Yeah. That there is no way you will come to Islam now, no matter what you try. Because now Allah has declared you from the people of it's a, it's a command from Hellfire. Allah. Yeah, so I mean if you're living and if, if somebody comes to you and says you're going to the Hellfire, 
and you're living right now. What he's basically telling you is that you will not become a Muslim. Yeah, but Allah did not really lower himself to the level of Abu Lahab and telling him, challenging you to become a Muslim. No, no. It was a subtle way of challenging. It was not a direct challenge to Abu Lahab, but it was a subtle way of saying, now you are never going to become a Muslim. Okay. So that is why we should be afraid of reaching a level of disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declares us as hypocrites. Okay. Remember the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu in which he said, whenever you sin, whenever you lie, there is a this small dark spot which is covering your heart. And then you lie again, then another dark spot and another dark spot until you become so, such a big liar, a big sinner of, uh, towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that your whole heart is covered with darkness. And that is when Allah stamps, seals the heart, no more guidance. That's what Allah says, Khatam Allahu ala kulubihim wa ala sam'ihim wa ala absarihim rishawa wa lahum azabun azim. So that is a, a, a point of fear. Don't think that, oh, right now I have only 40 dark spots on my heart. I still have a lot of area left. <laughs> no, no, no. If you're getting towards that point, you should be afraid because there will come a point where Allah will stop guiding you. Right now, maybe Allah is giving you chance. Allah is accepting your repentance, even though it might not be true and sincere. And you keep on doing, keep on sinning, keep on disobeying Allah. After a point, it will be sealed. So be careful and be afraid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, because once it is sealed, there is no turning back. Nobody can guide this person. Person whose heart is sealed, no coming back for this person. Medina and Revelation starts after Hijra. And the revelation was primarily concerned with the organization of the Muslim state. Okay how to organize this new Muslim state. Remember in Mecca, they were the oppressed minority. And now in Medina, they are ruling Medina. They have an entire city which is under their command. The Prophet, peace be upon him, is the head of state. Okay? He is not just a prophet anymore now. He is running the po political affairs of, of the, the people. Uh, the Jews and the, the other tribes of Medina, they have signed peace treaties with the Muslims. And so now they have to organize themselves. Now they need laws. Okay. That is why those people in Islam, and there are people like that in Islam, who say, well, I am a spiritual Muslim. I just, you know, have this spiritual side of Islam. I don't want to get involved in the rituals. I don't want to get involved in the laws. This is a non-practical way of living. Because as a human being, you have different needs. You have different needs. You have a spiritual need. Your heart needs the love of Allah, the fear of Allah, the closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your mind has needs, intellectual needs. Okay? Where you think, you ponder, you reflect, okay? you draw conclusions, you understand realities. That gives you peace. Whenever you understand something, that gives you peace. That's your intellectual need. Similarly, you have social, economic, you know, and other needs out there in society. So what you're basically saying when you say, I am just a spiritual Muslim is that I only accept Allah's guidance in spiritual areas. When it comes to my married life, I don't need Allah's guidance. When it comes to my business, I don't need Allah's guidance. When it comes to war and peace, politics, I don't need Allah's guidance. That's what you're basically saying. Because you will you will do those things. You are not going to cut yourself off and become a spiritual human being. There is no human being who can say, I am only a spiritual human being. No. You eat, you drink, you have a family, you have a community you live in, you have neighbors, you deal in certain level of politics, you have social requirements. So you are a complete human being when you are guided in all these areas. In all these areas. So Islam was not just sent for spiritual needs of humanity. Islam was sent for all kinds of needs for the human beings. And that is why people don't like Islam. The people who hate Islam or who struggle against Islam, that is their big problem. You know which version of Islam is really popular with the Islam haters? Which version of Islam they really like? The Sufi thought. 
Ah, beautiful. What a beautiful Islamic understanding this is. Sufism. Because Sufism just deals with your spiritual side. Sufism does not talk about jihad. Sufism does not talk about the rights of other human beings. It is, stress in Sufism is your spirituality. So they love Sufism in the West, the Western countries, the governments, they love it because there's no jihad. They won't struggle. Muslims will stop struggling against us. Muslims will st stop establishing their own economic systems. Okay, just give them a mosque somewhere, let them worship in it, we're happy, they're happy. Is that Islam? Islam is not limited to that. To build a mosque somewhere and worship in it and be happy. <laughs> no. Islam, Allah is sending guidance in all areas. Okay, what about your politics? What about your laws? What about your penalties? What about your social life? Your marriage law, marriage laws, your divorce laws, your economics. Okay? Alaikum salam. So this is a false understanding of Islam. Okay? This is like picking and choosing from Islam what you like and leaving what you don't like. No, Islam comes as a package. Islam comes as a package. Either you take everything or you leave everything. There's no compulsion in religion. Allah is not saying you have to take everything. you have to take Islam. But if you're going to take it, then take it fully. Okay? At least at the level of the belief. I mean at the level of the practice we're all lacking. We're all lacking in our practice of Islam. Nobody can say I am a perfect Muslim, but at least our belief should not be lacking. Our belief should be complete. Say, yes, I believe in this aspect of Islam and I also believe in this aspect of Islam. Maybe I am weak in practicing these aspects, but I believe in them. So at least let's start with the proper aqidah. A lot of the misguided groups within Islam, what they do is they pick and choose one area of Islam and then they, they present it as the whole thing. The same thing with books on Seerah, for example. Seerah of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him his life story, you'll find some books, they are talking about his wars. The whole book is talking about the wars of the Prophet and it portrays him as a great warrior. Because the agenda of the author in that book is Jihad. Let's, you know, push the Muslims towards Jihad. That is just one of the aspects of the life of the Prophet, peace be upon him, not his whole life. On the other hand, if you read like books which have been written by Sufi, scholars on the life of the Prophet, it will not even talk about any war at all. It will talk about love and mercy and his spirituality and his tasawwuf and you know his going and, and uh, making dhikr of Allah and getting up in the night and praying and all those aspects. It seems like the Prophet, if you read those biographies, never fought a war at all. See, so it depends on what your agenda is. You can present the Prophet as a man of peace, you can present the Prophet as a man of war. You can present him as a politician, you can, you know, present him as somebody, as a father, as, you know, whatever, a, a, a family member, guidance in his family life. So what I'm trying to say is this, these are all incorrect and partial understandings of Islam. If you want to get a complete understanding of Islam, then yes, the Prophet did fight in wars and we need to learn from his guidance in wars. And the Prophet also had a family life and a spiritual life. We need to learn from his spiritual and family life to become a complete Muslim so that we are not Muslims in one area of Islam and the other areas we have neglected. So the uh, Medinan revelation is primarily concerned with completing the other part, which is the laws. It was during this period that the majority of the social and economic laws of the Sharia were revealed in Medina, okay, not in Mecca. So the first group is the laws, obviously. And these laws, they refer to different laws uh, related to the pillars of Islam. So this is where the fasting, laws related to your fasting come in in Medina, zakah come in Medina, hajj at the very end, you know, laws related to hajj are revealed in uh, the Medinan revelation, talking about your dietary laws, what is prohibited, what should you eat, what is halal, what is haram in things that you eat and drink. Uh, also punishments related to adultery, punishments related to fornication, um, punishments related to social crimes. Uh, and if you read Surah An-Nur, it is full of the, the discussion on social crimes. Murder and theft, all of these are fixed uh, in the Medinan era. 
of revelation. Another thing which comes in the Medinan revelation is jihad. Okay? Is struggling for the sake of Allah, fighting for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. During the Meccan period, the Muslims were forbidden to take up arms against the Meccans who were oppressing them in order to avoid their decimation and to develop their patience. Okay, once again, the Meccan era is the era of building character, is building the strength. Okay, once that strength is there, then Allah allows you to use whatever means you have for the sake of Islam properly. Okay. So once you know, okay, this is where I need to use my power and this is where I need to be patient, then you are allowed to use power. But in the Meccan era, the Muslims are still under training. Muslims are still learning. You know, what does it mean to be powerful? What does it mean to be oppressed? They are understanding the different dynamics of life and of being believers and building their patience levels so that you know when they are in power, they don't do what was done to them. Okay. And that's exactly what happened. Muslims, they would not go in excess. When, even when they were seeking revenge, they would try to go to the point they were oppressed. They wouldn't go beyond that. And that can only happen if you have had good tarbiyah, good training in patience, good tarbiyah in uh, and knowledge of, of uh, what to do and what not to do. So jihad was uh, something which was uh, fixed in Medina. Obviously, the spiritual jihad was always there. Okay, jihad against your desires was always there. We're talking about jihad in the physical sense, struggling physically against evil. Okay, so this was uh, revealed in Medina. Verses were revealed in Medina related to that. <laughs> the right to fight against the enemy as well as the rules of war were revealed in Medina after the number of Muslims had dramatically increased. Also, this shows that Islam is a religion of common sense. Islam is a religion of common sense. In Mecca, the number of Muslims were too few to take up arms against the people, the Quraysh. Okay? And now one can say, well, why couldn't Allah send angels in Mecca to fight against the Quraysh people so that they would be victorious? But no, Allah will send angels there, then that would give justification to later generations in our times, what would happen in our times then? If we are in that situation, what should we do? Should we wait for angels to come and fight and say, okay, I'm going to declare war against these people who are oppressing me. I am one person and they are hundred. Doesn't matter. My faith is too strong and angels will come and defend me. No, Allah could have done that for the Prophet. Allah could have done that for the Muslims. But Allah wanted the Muslims to learn how things are done the right way. We are human beings, we are living in human societies and there, there are cause and effect relationships. Cause and effect. There are means to get to an end. That's what Allah wants to teach us. Even in the Hijrah, Hijrah, couldn't the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have sent Jibreel to pick up Prophet Muhammad and fly him all the way to Medina? Why does the Prophet have to go and prepare and you know hire a guide and then hide for three days and then go seeking the, the route and then finally make it to Medina after this perilous journey? To teach the Muslims that you have to make effort. To teach the Muslims you have to plan things. You cannot just expect results to come you know, like that. If you are having a headache, you don't just say, oh, I'm not going to take the medicine. I am a very strong believer. Allah is just going to take it away from you. No, when you have a headache, you go and take a Tylenol. <laughs> and then you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it work for you, right? Obviously at the end, Tylenol is not what is curing you. Allah is the one who cures you. But Allah has created Tylenol and given it shifa, given it some power to cure you. So you, you have to understand that there is a cause and effect relationship. There is a means to every end. If you don't seek the means, don't expect, you know, results. The whole semester you did not study and now final exams come. You come for the Fajr prayer. And it's like you ask the Imam, Imam, is there a special dua, you know, from the Sunnah I can say and get an A today? <laughs> There is no special du'a for that because you have not done your part. You have to do your part and then seek results from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is why jihad was 
required. That if you want to protect yourself, you need this means. Yes, Allah will help you. Allah will help you with His, you know, resources, with His angels, whatever. But you should not be counting on those angels. You should be doing your part. You should be struggling yourself. And if you see that you are not in a position to retaliate, then be patient. In Mecca, be patient. In Mecca, they were doing all kinds of horrible things to the Prophet and his companion. They even killed the Sahaba. Sumayya and her husband, the first martyrs, the, the parents of Ammar ibn Yasir, radiallahu anhu. They even killed them. Did the Prophet, peace be upon him, tell Ammar, go and now seek revenge? And imagine if your parents are killed by somebody. How would you feel? Wouldn't you want to take revenge? Wouldn't you, you want justice for yourself? But the Prophet kept telling him and kept telling the others, be patient, be patient, be patient. Your time will come. So you have to be smart. You have to use common sense. Okay, this is the time where I am weak. This other party is strong. They are oppressing me. I'm going to be patient. And I'm going to wait for a time when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives me the chance to free myself from this oppression. Until then, I'm going to be patient. So you have to be careful. <coughs> Any questions so far? Another topic which comes up in the Medinan revelation are the Ahlul Kitab. This is a new group of people which did not, which were not present in Mecca. In Mecca, you only had idol worshippers, okay, the Quraysh tribe. They were your open enemies, okay. But in Medina now, you have this new group of people who are actually very close to Islam and their beliefs. These are the Jews and the Christians. This is where now Islam starts interacting with the Jewish tribes in Medina. And the Prophet ﷺ, one of the first things he did in Medina was to sign the contract, you know, the, uh, the constitution of Medina. It was known as the constitution of Medina and it was signed by these different Jewish groups. And obviously later on they, they did not uh, hold their, their agreements, they did not, did not uh, honor their agreements and the agreements were broken. But one of the things was how to deal with these people. Should we trust them? Should we not trust them? Should we consider them to be believers? Should we consider them to be disbelievers? Are they falling in the same category as the, the Kuffar in Mecca or is there a new category we need to create for these people and treat them according to the new rules? So a lot of Medina in Revelation is about the Bani Israel, the people of the book, talks about their history, talks about their errors, how they disobeyed the prophets, you know, telling the Muslims their background. When you know the background of a people, you can deal with them better. Okay? If you know somebody has a criminal history, you know you cannot really trust this person with you know, your possessions, let's say. If you know somebody is a thief, you don't leave your possessions with this person like that. So knowing a person's background helps you. The same thing for the Bani Israel. Once the Muslims understood their background, they knew what to expect from them. They knew that they would do the same things, which their forefathers did with other prophets. That they would retaliate, that they would try to you know, undermine Islam, that they would try to, uh, uh, to create hypocrisy within the ranks, they would try to confuse the Muslims with questions so on and so forth. So all of those things were mentioned in the Medinan revelation. So Muslims came in contact with the Jews for the first time and with Christians on a large scale. So a number of Medinan verses tackled questions which were raised by the Jews in order to befuddle the Prophet and discredit Islam. So as I told you the story of Yusuf was an answer to their question. How did the Bani Israel end up in Egypt? They also would ask other questions. What is the genealogy of Allah? who Allah Ahad was revealed as an answer to that. So there were a lot of questions they would raise in order to, to put doubts in the hearts of the believers, put doubts in the hearts of the Muslims. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would answer them in these verses. The verses also outline laws concerning political alliances with Christians and Jews, as well as laws permitting marriage with them and eating their food. Because now you are interacting with these people so now these questions are arising can we eat their food if they invite us or if they slaughter an animal can we marry with them you know all of those laws are important because you are socially interacting with a group 
In Mecca, you don't have that problem. In Mecca, it's clear. The boundary is clear. You're a Muslim. He's not a Muslim. There are only two divisions. In Medina now, new divisions start appearing. New aspects uh, start appearing and you need more laws. Now. The fourth group, which also was not present in Mecca, were the hypocrites. And this also needed Allah, Allah's guidance. The Muslims did not know how to deal with this new group. In Mecca, there were no hypocrites. Why was that? Why were there no hypocrites in Mecca? What's the use of becoming a, dis a believer in, in Mecca? Why, why, is, why do hypocrites enter Islam? Because they see there is some benefit, some worldly benefit. Muslims are strong, let me join them right now. Okay? The two parties are fighting, let me join this one and also have good ties with this one. So that at the end, whoever wins, I will go with them. You know? Or I want to undermine Islam, I want to defeat Islam, but I am too weak right now to do it openly. So let me join in the ranks and then from inside undermine it. From inside Islam, try to put doubts and you know divisions and conflicts and so on. In Mecca, none of these things were needed. In Mecca, Islam is weak. Becoming a Muslim was putting yourself in trouble. Okay? So a hypocrite doesn't want trouble for himself. That is why this new group emerged in Medina, where a lot of the people of Medina, they accepted Islam because of worldly reasons. Okay? Everyone is becoming a Muslim, let me also join it. It's the fashion. It's the trend. In Medina, it's the fashion to become a Muslim. Okay? And it's against the flow, going against the flow, not to be a Muslim. Okay? If I become a Muslim, then I will get share in the the war, uh, you know, collections after the war, the Ghanai. Okay? If I become a Muslim, then I am eligible for certain payments from the government. Because remember, in Islam, the Prophet used to give these handouts. You might call it social security, but you know it was just you know every citizen would receive a salary. If you are a citizen of the Islamic State in the time of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, you would receive a salary from the state, from whatever funds came in the Muslim treasury, you would receive a salary. And the same was uh, done in the time of Abu Bakr and Omar radiallahu and the uh, other Khulafa Rashid. Okay, so it's actually a good thing to become a Muslim. I'm going to start receiving money. Okay. So there were a lot of factors because of which many people, they outwardly became Muslim, but deep inside their hearts, they had no Islam, they had no love for Allah, they had no regards for the Messenger of Allah, and they were trying to uh, plot against the Muslims. So the Muslims did not know what to do with these people. How should we treat these people? Should we accept them as our brothers? Should we reject them? Should we punish them? Should we leave them alone? What should be done with them? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed a lot of verses related to the hypocrites. Some entered Islam to try to destroy it from within because Muslims were strong and they could not openly oppose them. Others entered and exited shortly thereafter in order to shake the faith of the believers. This is an age-old strategy against Islam. What is the strategy? Okay, I am a Jew or a Christian. Let me say my Shahada become a Muslim for a week and then say, ah, this is not true religion, I am leaving it. What would that do to those others who are thinking about joining Islam? What would that do? Like put doubt, oh, okay, well, let, let's wait a minute, you know, I, I was almost sure that this is the right religion, but these people left it, that means maybe there is something wrong in it. So this was a strategy used by the hypocrites to undermine Islam so that it doesn't grow. And this is mentioned in Surah Al Baqarah where they, Allah says, and one of them would say, Become a believer in the morning and in the night you leave it. Why would they do that? To confuse the Muslims. What is happening? What is happening? Why do you think the people of Medina accepted Islam so quickly? When the Prophet came in, in Mecca, the Muslims, they were trying for 13 years, the Prophet was trying, he had very few Muslims. In Medina, he hasn't even stepped into Medina and the majority of the city is already a Muslim. Why? Because the Jews in Medina, for centuries they were saying, our Prophet is coming, our Prophet is coming. Why were the Jews living in Medina? 
Have you ever thought about that? Is Medina in that time a place to live? <laughs> For somebody to migrate and say, oh, I'm going to settle down in Medina. No, it's a very bad place to move in. It's hot. There is a lot of disease. In those times, there was a lot of sickness in Medina. A lot of sickness because of these swamps around Medina or these, you know, marshes around Medina. So, it was not a place for people to move in. So, Arabia, is, the, is it a place you would want to settle down if there is no Mecca and Medina because of its religious value? <laughs> Most of us would not want to move into a desert area. Okay? The attractive feature in that was that the Jews, they knew that the final prophet is coming there. It was written in their scriptures that the final messenger is going to appear in Medina. And so they had settled down there and for centuries they were telling the Arabs in Medina, you wait a minute, let our prophet come and then we'll show you guys. Let our prophet come and then we'll rule the earth again, so on and so forth. So when the Arab tribes in Medina, they heard about Prophet Muhammad, they went, sent a delegation to him, talked to him, recognized the signs which they were told by the Jews and they said, let's accept Islam. So all of them rushed to accept Islam because of the da'wah which the Jews had been doing for a long time. But then wait a minute, the Jews themselves does not, do not accept Islam. What's going on? See, confusion for the Muslims. What's going on? We became Muslim because of these people's da'wah and now these people themselves are not becoming Muslim. So a lot of confusion. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed verses about them to show this is their history. This is expected from them. They know the truth. They know he is the prophet. They have recognized him, but it's not new. They have done that with other prophets before. This is their, their trend. Okay. So guidance related to him, hypocrites, guidance related to the people of the scripture uh, was important in Medina. Any questions about Medina and Revelation? So Medina and verses expose their plots. Yes. My question is on the jihad. Yes. Um, the jihad that uh, in uh, Ali, uh, when they were trying to be, they said, the prophet said, and they never do the uh, physical jihad anymore, that there will be a jihad that is more stronger than the jihad that we fight in the home, and the jihad that we produce so much, a huge gun that is not going to exist anymore, that the jihad that we have the army is going to be from the earth. The art that is going to continue your, your future, your emotional future. Um, anything you like to do, the other will be controlling it that you should not do it, do it the better way. As Allah has said, it, right? so you're saying that the Prophet said that there will be no more physical jihad, um, but there will be the spiritual jihad. Okay? Um, if that were true, then the Sahaba after the death of the Prophet, peace be upon him, would not have fought anymore. If you look at the Sahaba after the death of the Prophet peace be upon him, actually most of the battles started after the death of the Prophet peace be upon him, against the false prophets, against those who refused to pay zakah, against the Roman Empire, the Persian empires. So that is not true to say that you know jihad should end in the physical sense. And as I said that these were ahadith created by groups of people within Islam and those who wanted to end this institution of jihad within Islam. You know, Hadith for example, the famous Hadith where the Prophet peace be upon him and Abu Bakr are coming back from the battle and Prophet peace be upon him tells him, uh, Oh Abu Bakr, we just came back from the minor jihad, now we are going to the major jihad, the jihad of, of the nafs. This is fabricated narrations. No such Hadith exists. This is so that you belittle that jihad. Say, oh, that is not the real jihad, the big jihad is in here. Let's all work on our spiritual jihad and forget about correcting the society around us. Okay? So this is actually a plan of the disbelievers against